This is the first voice memo to accompany your Stonehenge PowerPoint. On the first This is the first voice memo to accompany your Stonehenge PowerPoint. On the first slide here, you should see the location of Stonehenge in southern England, about 45 minutes outside of London, if you ever happen to be there. And the little dot just north of Stonehenge is Avebury. And Avebury is the town where the stones for the trilithons originated. It's about 20 miles to the north. You can actually see all of these places if you go into the Google Earth images in the Stonehenge module. Um, it'll fly you right to all the different locations that I'll be talking about in this PowerPoint. So click to the next slide. And you see sort of a very confusing diagram. This is an aerial view of the Stonehenge monument itself. And literally for hundreds of years, people thought about Stonehenge as sort of a standalone monument. And that's not really the way it's being considered anymore. But when we look at the monument, you see some really interesting sorts of things. Um, you see the outer circle, which is called a henge. It's just a ditch carved right into the chalk, which is the type of bedrock they have in southern England. And then you see a series of purple circles, which are called Aubrey holes, and there are 56 of those. I'll be describing those later. There are, kind of moving inward, there are Z holes and Y holes, which are, again, just holes carved into the chalk, and I'll talk about those at another point. The black dots represent what are called station stones. All of these are represented differently in, in altering interpretations of the purpose and the function of the Stonehenge Monument. And so you'll hear about all these later, but I just wanted to show you where they were in orientation to each other. The light purple ring towards the center is the ring of sarsen trilithons. And so the trilithons are the three stone structure that you saw when you did the uh, introduction assignment to Stonehenge. And then there's also sort of a horseshoe ring of trilithons in the center of the Stonehenge monument. Then um, stones that are actually at Stonehenge, but very few people really maybe give much pause to consider, are the blue stones, which are blue circles um, on the inside of the circle of trilithons. And then there's also the remnants of what used to be like an inner horseshoe of blue stones that mimicked the shape of the sarsen um, trilithons. So then kind of to the northeastern portion of the Henge, you see a central avenue. And this central avenue connects Stonehenge to the Avon River, although it doesn't in my little diagram here. It just kind of shows you where it's located. And then finally, within the central avenue is the Heel Stone, which some people interpret to be the most important monument at Stonehenge, um, the most important stone, rather. Um, and we'll talk about all of these delightful features in, in the next uh, voice memo or two. So click to the next slide and what you see here is a map of the Stonehenge landscape which is very different than what we just looked at. So you find the little orange dot that represents Stonehenge. So that is where Stonehenge is located um, relative to the River Avon and there is, now I know you're from Rochester and you probably pronounce that Avon, but in southern England they pronounce it Avon. There is a uh, av that central avenue that you saw in the last diagram connects Stonehenge all the way to a place that's now called Blue Stonehenge, which is right on the river. Just north of Stonehenge and Blue Stonehenge is a place called the Cursus, which is kind of a dividing area. Um, it, it's, it's a henge in that it's a series, of, uh, sort of a rectangular ditch that's carved into the bedrock. And north of the Cursus there are two features. One's called Durrington Walls, and Durrington Walls marks the location of like sort of a central plaza and around which there have been hundreds of homes, Neolithic village homes that were um, identified. And Durrington Walls also has an avenue that connects it to the River Avon. And just south of Durrington Walls there's a small little place called Woodhenge. And what people do today that is different from the way Stonehenge was interpreted even 10 years ago is they try to see where Stonehenge kind of fits into the larger landscape. What was its role in society um, during the time of its construction? And so that's really one of the biggest shifts in thinking about Stonehenge is what does it really mean not only as a monument itself, but how did it, how was it used by the people who lived in the area? So if you click on the next slide, what you see are some artist renditions of how some of these giant trilithon stones were actually shaped. Now, what's sort of inconvenient is that 
most of the materials, in fact all of the materials that were used by the Stonehenge builders were biodegradable. So at best these are all speculations. Um, what you see here are some Neolithic people who are attempting to shape the sarsen sandstones, which are used for the, the trilithons, the big three stone structures. They're using stones and animal fat to kind of shape it into these sort of rectangular shapes, roughly. And so one of the things that archaeologists have done is shown that when you have a crack in a rock, one of the ways you can make that, that crack larger is by pouring hot animal fat into the rock, into the crack rather, and that causes the crack to expand. And then when you pour cold water in afterwards, it causes the crack to contract. And through a series of expanding and contracting this crack, eventually you make the crack go all the way through the rock until you have generally a rectangle. Um, the sarsen sandstones were so hard that really the only way that you could shape them beyond that was by bashing it with other rocks of similar hardness. And that's probably how some of the detail work, like the mortise and the tenon holes were, I'm sorry, the the tenon projections and the mortise holes, how they were constructed. And again, that was probably an agonizingly slow process. There are all sorts of interesting yet totally erroneous stories about who built Stonehenge and what it was used for and things like that. The most popular misconception about the Stonehenge builders is that the, it was built by Druids, who are basically uh, nature worshippers in, in southern England. And the reason that it's not is that Stonehenge was abandoned for over a thousand years by the time there's the first archaeological evidence of Druids even being in the area. So it's highly unlikely that they happened to be around um, when Stonehenge was certainly being constructed. And Stonehenge, you'll learn, was built over a period of about 1,500 years, so, and the Druids don't show up until a thousand years afterwards. There are stories of Merlin the Magician be using this as like a place where he would cast spells. Merlin the Magician, of course, is associated with King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table and all other sort of lore like that. Um, there's also, if you click to the next slide, I didn't make this slide. This is kind of a ridiculous slide, but it's funny. But there are stories of African giants basically bringing blocks from Africa up to Stonehenge and just kind of leaving them there. Um, there's all sorts of crazy stories, which if you continue, we'll read about, um, like aliens using it as a place to land spaceships and things like that. Um, and literally, we could spend the rest of the semester talking about all sorts of weird hypotheses. But what we do instead in this class is we focus on archaeological evidence and, and scientific evidence. So click to the next slide. And you'll see that I divided these next few slides into Stonehenge 1, Stonehenge 2, and Stonehenge 3. And that's because um, Stonehenge seems to have been built in three different stages. And it gets increasingly complex with each, with each stage. The first stage of Stonehenge construction was relatively simple. There was a circular henge that was carved into the ground. And what the Stonehenge builders did was they dug out the henge and created a ditch and then used that sediment to kind of make a mound on the inside of the ditch. And then they built, or dug rather, 56 of what are called Aubrey holes, which um, there's all sorts of fun speculation about what the Aubrey holes were used for. The Aubrey holes were named after John Aubrey, who was an archaeologist who discovered them in the late 1700s. Archaeological evidence of remains in this area has led archaeologists to, I'm sorry, I used the word archaeologist like 10 times, <laughs> has uh, led to the identification of a culture known as the windmill people to, um, to have been responsible for construction under the Stonehenge I period um, at a time about 3200 BC, so a little bit more than 5,000 years ago. And one of the really interesting ways that you can learn about different cultures is by studying some of their practices, like what they do with dead bodies, because it's kind of something that every culture has to deal with. So the windmill people buried their dead bodies in these massive graves, in these large stone encased tombs, and what they would do is leave the dead bodies out for a while until basically the uh, flesh had already been like removed from scavengers and decomposition. And then they would sort the dead bodies like by parts when they would put them in the tombs. Like all the heads would go in one side and all the long bones in another. Um, and so that's kind of what they did. 
they were primarily farmers. In fact, all of the cultures that lived in this area had always been apparently farmers, based on some evidence, and then also some nomadic hunter-gatherers. Um, so that's basically what the windmills did. They dug a ditch, they made some Aubrey holes, and within those Aubrey holes, there's been all sorts of interesting things found. There have been fragments found of blue stones, which weren't at Stonehenge at this time. Um, there's also been cremated remains found of dead bodies in there as well. Um, some estimations suggest that there were about 250 dead bodies that were buried, cremated, and then had ashes scattered in some of these Aubrey holes over about a 500 year period. Um, but estimations of the number of people based on just the sheer amount of cremated remains is kind of a, it's not, it's an imperfect science, it's, it's just an estimate. We also see erected during Stonehenge 1 is called the heel stone. Um, the heel stone is basically what's called a glacial erratic. It's a rock that is eroded by glaciers at one point um, for, from one location and deposited in another. Um, in western New York, we see erratics all the time, right? Like if you drive through areas like Menden or Palmyra and you see farmland, and then in a farmer's field, you see a big giant rock in the middle of the field. That's a glacial erratic. It was eroded probably from the Adirondacks or northern Canada and deposited um, and just kind of left in a field by glaciers as they were melting away. Um, well, the heel stone gets its name, well, who really knows how it gets its name, but there's two hypotheses. One has to do with the Greek god Helios, um, who is the sun god, because the sun rises over the heel stone on June 21st, which is the summer solstice. And another story is a, sort of a, a story about a friar who was very pious and who was walking in a field and was tempted by the devil and he said no and the devil threw a stone at him and he was so pious that when the stone hit the friar's heel it just impaled itself into the ground and there you have it. Um, so depending on your different interpretations of Stonehenge, the heel stone turns out to be a, a significant stone because it is the stone that the sun rises over on the summer solstice. It's a sarsen sandstone, just like all of the trilithons. The sarsen sandstones, one of their most distinctive properties is that they're very strong stones. It's like quartz cemented with quartz. They're very resistant to weathering. And that's one of the reasons that the sarsen sandstones, the trilithons, stand up so well, um, even though they're over 4,500 years old. And so, again, this is the rock used for the heel stone and all of the trilithons at Stonehenge as well. On the next slide, you see what the sarsen sandstones look like even today in Avebury. So you can see that they're just, again, big rocks littered in a field. Avebury is 20 miles north of Stonehenge, and so somehow, before the advent of the wheel, the Stonehenge builders had to figure out a way to take these enormously heavy stones, 40, 50 tons stones, and figure out how to get them 20 miles south to erect them at Stonehenge. But at least they didn't have sort of the added challenge of having to core them out of rock. They just kind of had to um, get them out of a field, shape them, and then drag them 20 miles over a variable terrain uh, down to Stonehenge. During the second phase of Stonehenge construction, a group seems to come to power in this area known as the Beakers. And they're called the Beakers because, conveniently, they, their dead bodies, which are buried in mass graves primarily, are also buried with these Beakers that you see located in the upper right-hand corner of the slide here. These Beakers were available uh, commonly throughout Europe which means that minimally there was some sort of contact or trade between England and mainland Europe during this time, this time being about 3000 BC. There were also weapons buried in mass graves, which seemed to indicate that um, there was at least some sort of conflict that these beakers experienced with other people around them. So in this picture, or, sorry, based on studies and reviews of the teeth and some of the other sort of bone structure of the Beaker people. It looks like the Beakers themselves originated in the Alps of Europe and then migrated, for whatever reason, over to Stonehenge. 
and lived in this area. Whether they took over the windmills by force or they just kind of assimilated or even the windmills kind of changed and assimilated with, with the beakers over time, it, it's not really clear. There's not a tremendous amount of archaeological evidence from this period about the people anyway. One of the most important things that the beakers did at Stonehenge is that they first constructed rings of blue stones in Stonehenge, which if you look at this picture of Stonehenge, you kind of have to force yourself to find the blue stones. They're much smaller than the trilithons, um, but they're still pretty big stones. They are currently um, located in the Y and the Z holes, but the blue stones themselves are about four tons or 8,000 pounds in weight and can be up to six feet in height. Um, there's also fragments of the blue stones in a lot of the other stones at Stonehenge. So it seems that the blue stones were moved around multiple times in different incarnations of Stonehenge, if you will. If you go to the next slide, you see the source for the blue stones. There are differing hypotheses about what is most important at Stonehenge. Some people actually think that the blue stones were most important. And here you see that the blue stones came from the Prescoli Mountains in Wales and were then transported through the Bristol Channel and up the River Avon and then dragged a mile or so um, from the river to Stonehenge. And there's all sorts of very interesting stories that we'll learn about the blue stones in just a bit. But they were rearranged multiple times in the picture in the lower right hand corner there you see sort of a double horseshoe shape for the blue stones um, and again they seem to be relocated in some cases it looks like they were relocated to blue stonehenge for a while and then brought back to stonehenge um, because this is over hundreds of years of period where cultures are changing and values are changing i mean if you think about just some of our own cultural practices how they've differed as you know, Westerners in the United States of America in the last 200 years, you can understand how people's cultural traditions change over time and the way they use monuments would then therefore also change over time. On the next slide, you see Stonehenge 3, and this is actually the pinnacle of development for Stonehenge. Stonehenge 3 is accomplished by a group called the Wessex, who live in the area from about 2600 to 20, or 2400 to 2600 BC. They seem to be the most um, sophisticated, I guess cosmopolitan if you want to use that word, um, group to live in Stonehenge. They were buried in individual gravestones, not in mass graves, although, by the way, all three of these cultures cremated their dead as well. Um, but they had individualized gravestones, or not gravestones, but mounds where people were buried in. And they, some of the mounds, the closer they were to Stonehenge, the wealthier these people happened to be, though they were buried with gold objects. And gold isn't native to England, so that means that there had to be some serious trade going on um, between all different parts of Europe and the Wessex. So it's believed that then, therefore the Wessex were more organized traders. Um, they were buried in these mounds. Most of the burial mounds are south of an area called the Cursus, which we'll come back to again um, because it it sort of fills in part of uh, one archaeologist's interpretation of, of Stonehenge. But they initially seemed to remove the blue stones from from Stonehenge and put up the trilithons. And there's a couple interpretations for this behavior. Uh, first thing is that when you conquer someone, there's no more definitive way to show that you're more powerful than them than to dismantle their monuments and put up your own. Um, so some people believe that this was kind of an act of war uh, or an act of, I don't know, superiority or dominance. They ultimately do bring the blue stones back because they're there today. So, so whether that indicates that there was some assimilation between the groups over time or a totally different hypothesis is that um, they took the blue stones out because they needed the room to erect the trilithons, and then once the trilithons were erected, then they went back and put the blue stones back. Um, both of those interpretations have absolutely no evidence to support one or the other, but, um, but there you have it. And so when you look at this diagram, you see a whole lot of different features at Stonehenge here. You, this is where you have no blue stones, but you also see the, the henge around Stonehenge. You see the 
uh, heel stone. There's a couple other small stones there that we didn't talk about that aren't particularly important. You see the, the station stones, which are located sort of right along the henge, and then you see the circle of trilithons and the inner horseshoe of trilithons as well. If you go to the next slide, you see a totally completed Stonehenge. So the blue stones are then returned. They are, there's a circle of them within the trilithon circle. If you look closely, you can see them. And then there's also a horseshoe within the trilithon horseshoe as well. After the blue stones were returned, there was an avenue, a central avenue built about approximately two miles in length that connected Stonehenge to the River Avon. And if you look back at one of our very early slides, it's not a straight avenue and it's unclear kind of why it curves because it certainly made the whole trip longer, but there it is. And a lot of the stones that were used for Stonehenge construction are actually missing today. So um, it's unclear where they were moved to, whether they were moved for more monuments or whether they were taken away by other people. Um, so there you have the, after this sort of um, Stonehead, this, this layout of Stonehenge construction, Stonehenge is abandoned about 1500 BC and remains abandoned um, for, hunt for over a thousand years afterwards. There are hypotheses, there have been hypotheses about the use of Stonehenge for centuries. Uh, and they vary depending on um, time period and interpretation. And it's very likely that since Stonehenge was used for over 1500 years, that it had more than one purpose, or at least was used for multiple um, reasons over that time period. And so here we're going to talk about a couple of the, many of the early hypotheses and then focus more in depth on two more modern hypotheses based on recent archaeological finds. So because the sun rises above the heel stone on June 21st, early archaeologists argued that Stonehenge could have been used as a primitive calendar. Uh, also because it's oriented towards the, the rising of the sun on the longest day of the year, it's also been argued that Stonehenge could have been a site of nature worship and everything was sort of organized around nature. Some people have argued that if you look at different variations of um, numbers between the Aubrey holes, the Z holes, and the Y holes, that it could be used to predict astronomical events like lunar eclipses or minimally to predict the cycles of the moon. Um, there's not a tremendous amount of evidence that that can show that, but Different people have argued that if you, you know, divide the number of Aubrey holes, for instance, by 2, 56 divided by 2 is 28, which is roughly one lunar cycle. So they see some sort of um, astronomical significance to some of the numbers in the X, Y, or, sorry, in the Z holes, the Y holes, and the Aubrey holes. Other people argue that Stonehenge was built by aliens, and uh, one of these proponents, his name was is Eric von Doniken, who wrote a book called Chariots of the Gods in the 1960s about the idea that aliens came to Earth, and when they came to Earth, they gave certain cultures, including the Stonehenge culture, uh, the... I don't know, the know-how to build these amazing monuments. And then they took that knowledge with them, and then they left. Um, and other cultures that the... Uh, Ancient astronauts allegedly helped to include the Egyptians, uh, the, the pyramid builders in Egypt, the pyramid builders in uh, the Mayans, and also the Easter Island culture, and they're kind of located in the Pacific, it's kind of near Chile, but not, not really near anything. Um, Easter Island is in the middle of the Pacific, of the South Pacific Ocean. So, anyway, moving on to, uh, to a couple hypotheses that do have a bit of, of research behind them. Um, the first current hypothesis that we're going to talk about on the next slide is the idea that Stonehenge was actually a site of healing, um, sort of a mo an ancient Lourdes. Uh, Lourdes is a place in, in France that was supposedly um, has this sort of holy water. I'm pretty sure my grandmother <laughs> has some of this holy water. Um, and that it's supposed to have these sort of healing properties because it's holy water, basically. And so there's a quarry inscription, which has been interpreted by two archaeologists in England, uh, 
Tim Darville and, and Wainwright in 2008. And they found it in the Presley Mountains, which if you remember, is where the blue stones actually originated. And they claim that the quarry inscription indicates that the Presley Mountains had some sort of sort of magical healing properties, if you will. And then they go on and have done recent excavations within Stonehenge and in the landscape around Stonehenge. And Darville and Wainwright have actually found blue stone fragments recovered in the Cursus, in Aubrey Holes, in Y Holes, in Z Holes, at Woodhenge, and at sacred sites all the way to Denmark. Um, maybe even more compelling than that is that some of the human remains that have been excavated around Stonehenge um, seem to be the remains of people who had very chronic illnesses, whether they were crippled or had some sort of really painful, debilitating disease. And a lot of them seem to originate in places very far from Stonehenge, yet they were buried near Stonehenge, and they were also buried with pieces of these blue stones. Um, which, so I guess if they were supposed to be healing stones, they obviously didn't work for everyone. But um, anyway, that is one of the current hypotheses concerning um, the use of Stonehenge, that it was actually a place of healing and a place of, uh, I don't know, of magic, if you will. If you go to the next slide, you see the beginning of a very sort of in-depth hypothesis, which is something that if you have Netflix, you can watch a show called Stonehenge Decoded, and it's all about this hypothesis. Um, but you can research it pretty much anywhere. And that's the idea that Stonehenge actually was a place, that a monument built for ancestors. This is an idea popularized by an archaeologist named Mike Parker Pearson, who um, is working currently in, in England. And he had this idea, and we're going to go back to that Stonehenge landscape map in just a bit, that Stone, the area around Stonehenge was divided into two areas, the land of the living and the land of the dead. Um, he saw the, the cursus as kind of a dividing line between the land of the living and the dead. That's that long, rectangular, narrow henge. And he thought everything north of the cursus was the land of the living, and everything south, where Stonehenge, for instance, was located, was the land of the dead. And Parker Pearson has made some amazing archaeological finds that we'll be talking about in the next couple slides. One of the most important things that he, that Parker Pearson decided to do was to excavate the area around Stonehenge rather than the monument itself. So there is a large henge located a couple miles north of Stonehenge called Durrington Walls, and it had first been discovered uh, 20, 30 years ago when there was a road being built in the area. Parker Pearson decided not to excavate Durrington Walls, but to excavate the landscape around Durrington Walls. And what he found was just amazing. He found the remains of literally hundreds of homes. Um, and Very simple homes, but nevertheless, he found the largest Neolithic village that has ever been uncovered. And he will be spending many summers, I'm pretty sure, excavating that Neolithic village. It likely was home to hundreds of people, although Parker Pearson thinks that it was a seasonal residence. He doesn't think that they were there year-round because he hasn't found any evidence of farming within the, uh, the homes of the people. I'm going to tell you that a lot of people have some issues with, with Parker Pearson's hypothesis simply because it's very strange to have like hundreds of homes in a Neolithic village that's only occupied for a couple of weeks out of the year. Um, anyway, so Durrington Walls is about two miles from Stonehenge. It's been carbon dated to about 3000 BC, which is the time of the beakers. Um, the henge itself, instead of being lined with stone, was likely lined with two rings of timber posts, large sort of logs put in place. And Parker Pearson excavated literally hundreds of nine-month-old pig bones, and we'll talk about why that might be in just a bit. excavated portion of the Durrington Walls henge. And there you see the contrast between the green grass and the white chalk, which is really just the bedrock below southern England here. Durrington Walls has a short avenue that connects it to the Avon River. So again, you have this idea of both Stonehenge and Durrington Walls having some significance to the Avon River. And that's important in Parker Pearson's interpretation as well. What he found was 
all of these small little houses around the henge of Durrington Walls. Um, they were square homes, some 8x8, eight eight, some 16x16. 16 16. They're relatively simple homes with a clay floor, a hearth for cooking, um, and the remains of some mud and straw walls. Parker Pearson argues that he can actually find the outline for some box beds, and um, in some cases... He's found areas where it looks like there's little knee holes, you know, holes for people's knees as they kneeled next to the fire and kind of tended to the hearth during the day, which is kind of amazing. Um, if you don't have Netflix, actually, pretty much all of Stonehenge Decoded you can find on uh, on YouTube in 10-minute segments as well. And it's really interesting. They kind of walk you right through the excavation. They get all up in the dirt, and, and you can really kind of see the tedium that involves archaeological excavations. Okay, click to the next slide. Just south of Durrington Walls is a very small henge called Woodhenge. And you see a recreation of Woodhenge here, but the timber posts that you see in the ground likely would have been much taller. And this is just kind of to give you a sense of what things would have looked like without actually recreating all of it. Woodhenge is about a mile and a half northeast of Stonehenge. And based on the post holes that are actually carved right into the chalk below, it seems to be a series of six concentric rings of timber posts. They're not deep enough to be stones, but um, and there's fragments of wood found in them. There also seems to be an area where there's a larger hole, it's more irregular and deeper in shape, and so People have argued that perhaps that did have a standing stone in it, and that standing stone seemed to be oriented towards the sunset on the summer solstice on June 21st. So I'm going to put all the pieces together for you in just a couple of slides. The next slide explains how Parker Pearson takes all of this seemingly unrelated data and pulls it together into a cohesive story. So remember, Parker Pearson had the idea that the cursus, which is that long, narrow, rectangular henge, actually separated the land of the living from the land of the dead. So what Parker Pearson thinks happened on June 21st, on the summer solstice, was that the Stonehenge builders would start their morning in Stonehenge, and the sun would rise over the heel stone, and this, he thought, was, again, now think about the symbolism behind it being the summer solstice. It's the longest day of the year. These are farmers. And so he thinks that it has a huge significance um, to these people because they're celebrating the abundance and, and the rebirth of, of nature. So he thinks that the sun rises over the heel stone and that the Stonehenge builders walk from Stonehenge along the avenue to, to Avon River, and then they walk all along the river all the way to Durrington Walls and to Woodhenge. So he thinks that symbolically what the Stonehenge builders are doing is accepting fertility from their ancestors. So he sees this as a place of ancestor worship, really, that they're taking the fertility from the land of the dead. It's a gift that their ancestors are giving them, and they're bringing it to the land of the living. They're ending their day in Durrington Walls. He thinks the opposite happens, if you click to the next slide, on the 21st of December. That's the shortest day of the year. How did he pick this day? Well, remember all those nine-month-old pig bones. Uh, most animals have their babies in the spring around March. Nine months later would be December, and that's why he thinks there were so many nine-month-old pig bones. That's, he thinks that's the significance of the December, the, the winter solstice, the shortest day of the year. So in contrast, in the winter, everything looks like it's dying. Everything is turning brown and turning black and going kind of into hibernation, into death almost. So that's what he thinks is happening that day. He thinks that on the the winter solstice that the Stonehenge builders are waking up and the sun rises and this is a day of death. This is a day to remember they're dead. He thinks that they started in the land of the living and then they walked along the river all the way to Stonehenge. He thinks while they were walking along the river they were throwing the cremated remains of their dead into the river. He doesn't have any evidence for this yet, but it's just his hypothesis. And then he get they get to Blue Stonehenge at the base of sort of the uh, the avenue, right where the avenue hits the river, which isn't la labeled on this diagram because Parker Pearson literally just found it like a year ago. He just found Blue Stonehenge like a year ago. So they walked from Durrington Walls all the way to Stonehenge, throwing the cremated remains into the river. 
And then afterwards, he thinks they returned to Durrington Wall walls and had a big party kind of like the party that people have after funerals today and that's why there are so nine so many nine month old pig bones they went back to durrington walls and they had a celebration for the lives of their family members so i just mentioned blue stonehenge go to the next slide blue stonehenge was found by parker pearson in 2009 it's a very small henge only 30 feet in diameter and he has sort of a an interesting hypothesis about Blue Stonehenge. He found it just doing like a gravity survey and, and then has commenced sort of excavation of the henge as well. So it's believed from this gravity survey that there were 80 stone holes that likely held blue stones because he's excavated a few and they all seem to contain fragments of blue stones. There are currently, I'm sorry, there are currently 80 blue stones at Stonehenge today. Gravity surveys of Blue Stonehenge indicate that there were 24 holes that used to hold blue stones. And he has dated that to Stonehenge too, which is the time period of the beakers. If you remember, the beakers moved around the blue stones quite a bit. So he thinks that in one of their incarnations, they took 24 of the blue stones to blue Stonehenge. And then he thinks that, that the other 56 he that used to sit in the 56 Aubrey holes because 56 plus 24 equals 80 and that's how many blue stones are at Stonehenge today. So he thinks this is part of some of the reconfigurations of the blue stones done by the beakers during Stonehenge 2. And again he thinks this reiterates the importance of the river simply because it's all it all goes back to the river. All of the roads just in the Stonehenge area lead to the river. On the last slide, what you see here are a series of burial chambers on the Stonehenge landscape. Um, round barrows are burial chambers. You see flat graves. You see long barrows, which are also burial chambers. And while it's certainly not true that all of the barrows are located south of the Cursus, you see that many of them are.